Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. Welcome to the Faculty Forum Online, a program of the MIT Alumni Association, sponsored in part by MIT Professional Education. I'm your moderator, David Corcoran. I'm Associate Director of the Knight Science Journalism Program at MIT and former editor of Science Times at the New York Times. Our um, guest today is um, uh, Professor Eric Alm, but before I introduce him, uh, I'd just like to say to the alumni looking in, as questions come to you during today's webcast, use the box below the live stream to enter them, and we'll get to as many as we can. Just how important is your microbiome, the totality of microbes living inside your body on any given day? When you consider that nearly all of one's vital organs rely on your microbiome for maintaining health, that there are hundreds of individual species of microbes living on you and in you as we speak, you begin, you begin to understand the curiosity that drives our guest, Eric Alm, a professor of biological engineering and of civil and environmental engineering. Eric Alm joins us today to help us understand and appreciate the microbiome and its work. Professor Alm, please start by giving us an overview of your current research. Very happy to do that. And um, let me just start by saying uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, share a little bit about uh, the microbiome and a little bit about the work we do on the microbiome here at MIT. Um, <clears throat> let me start out uh, and I'll show you a few, uh, a, a few slides and kind of walk you through the, the state of microbiome research, um, and uh, especially uh, here at MIT. Um, first, let me uh, just uh, point out um, a few of the, the affiliations. Uh, apart from MIT, um, I'm on the board of directors of Open Biome. Open Biome is a nonprofit organization that uh, spun out of my lab here at MIT. Uh, and its core mission is to pr uh, provide safe access to fecal transplants, and we'll talk a little bit about those in, in, in just a minute, um, to folks suffering from recurrent C. difficile infections. And we've treated um, over, uh, over 10,000 patients right now with this uh, microbiome-based therapeutic. <clears throat> I'm also at the Broad Institute, um, where we do a lot of the, the genomics. Um, and I co-direct the center uh, here at MIT and in, in Mass General Hospital for uh, uh, microbiome informatics and therapeutics. So I like to start with this slide. And uh, what you're looking at here is, is really the, the price of genome sequencing over time. And the first genome cost us uh, quite a lot to, to sequence, that first human genome. Uh, but over the years, the price has been falling. And if you look at the y-axis, it's, it's on a log scale, OK? And, and sort of the, that, that top slope for the first uh, you know, six or seven years there is, is about the equivalent of what uh, most MIT alumni will uh, be familiar with, and that's Moore's Law. So it says that you know, our processing uh, uh, power uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, the, the price per CPU cycle and things like that is, uh, is uh, decreasing, and it's decreasing exponentially. But if we look at this graph, we see that the, the price of sequencing DNA is uh, dipping faster than exponentially. Okay? And there's very few things that uh, show the super exponential behavior um, in, in nature. Uh, in fact, most of them are, are human technologies. As, as we develop technologies to make technology development faster, we get this nice super exponential uh, decline. And so right now, it's very inexpensive to, to sequence genomes. Uh, and in a large part, I think that's what's fueling the sort of microbiome revolution. And so. Uh, we're able to use high throughput DNA sequencing as sort of a microscope to see this invisible world of microorganisms inside of us. Now, <clears throat> when we originally decided to sequence the human genome, 
the idea was that uh, we would get a blueprint. And when I was in graduate school, we were, you know, uh, uh, the academic community was, was sequencing the, the human genome. Uh, the idea, we didn't know how many genes there were. But we thought if we had the blueprint of all the genes in the human body, we would have all the targets for drugs. And that drug development would get a lot faster and it would get a lot cheaper. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, drug development hasn't gotten uh, much faster. Um, and we've been spending more and more money on it. And so, so this is also an exponential uh, sort of logarithmic scale. And you can see the, the number of new drugs per billion dollar of uh, research and development money spent um, is actually going down. I think this is um, uh, not going to be the case for long. Certainly, uh, sequencing the human genome has provided an enormous amount of insight that's, you know, uh, ev every major drug company is doing a lot of bioinformatics, a lot of DNA sequencing. Um, but we just haven't seen the gains yet because we need to figure out how those, you know, 25,000 or so genes fit together into pathways and develop these small molecules that bind to, you know, various uh, protein products in those pathways and inhibit them or activate them and things like that. So, so there's been a lag time. What I think is exciting about microbiome is uh, a slightly different paradigm for, for drug development. And, and it, in, in some ways, it, it kind of short circuits uh, the traditional drug development pipeline. And I'll explain how that works in a minute. So we start with, uh, with humans. We sample their microorganisms. Um, on the one hand, we, we sequence them, and we identify what bacteria are living in and on those, those individuals. Um, <clears throat> then we can compare groups of healthy people to groups of sick people, and we can see if the, you know, maybe the sick people are, are missing one particular bacteria. And if they're missing one bacteria, that gives us a hypothesis, and it says, well, perhaps you need that bacteria to, to be healthy, and, and, and if you do, then we can look at the other arm of this diagram, and, and, and we see we start with that healthy person, and it says culture. And that means we, we identify those organisms, we, we grow them up individually on, on plates, uh, and then, then we isolate them. So we can grow them on their own, apart from all of the other organisms. And, and we put them in the freezer in case we ever need them again. Well, if we decide that there's one particular bacteria that none of the sick people have and all the healthy people have, then we can revive that bacterium from, uh, from our freezer stocks. We can put it in a pill and we can feed it to patients. And now we have a hypothesis for a clinical trial um, that was actually very fast. And, and what it did is it, it took advantage of the fact that we're really, really good at uh, sequencing DNA right now. And we can do it very cheaply and we can do it for you know, hundreds or thousands of people and, and, and figure out what are the bacteria, you know, bacterial differences between healthy and sick? So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's the, the grand vision. Um, nobody's really kind of turned that crank yet and, and developed a microbiome-based uh, therapeutic, a synthetic microbiome drug um, based on this concept. Uh, but I think we're not far off. And, and I'll take a minute to explain some of the research uh, that I've done um, and really, it's been Susan Erdman in the uh, MIT Department of Comparative Medicine who, who's driven this line of research. Um, we got interested in this uh, back in 2010. There was a paper out of the Harvard School of Public Health. They analyzed, I think it was 1.4 million years of patient data. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of patients over decades. And they asked a simple question, um, how can we get fat as we get old? <laughs> And um, they, they analyzed, uh, you know, many different dietary components, and, and they also analyzed other uh, uh, lifestyle, uh, behavioral choices, and things like that. And, and one of the things they found is, um, gosh, exercise doesn't matter. And so some of you may find that to be a relief. Other, others of you might think, oh, I've been, <laughs> well, I've been wasting all this time uh, on the treadmill these, these last few years. Um, but diet, diet mattered quite a bit. And um, <clears throat> you can see kind of circled in red here are the things that are making us gain weight. Uh, the, the more servings of these foods we eat per day, the more uh, weight we gain as, as we get older. And on that list are uh, potato chips, French fries, uh, sugary drinks, and processed meats. So sort of the, the fast food diet. Um, what they found that was unexpected 
was um, yogurt. And, and this is not, you know, some super health food yogurt. This is hundreds of thousands of people. This is the average yogurt that, that people are eating. And what they found is that for every additional serving yogurt that, that people ate every day, um, they tended to uh, lose about uh, a pound every, every four years, something like that. And really, when they looked at the, the uh, components of, of yogurt, of, of you know, your, your average run-of-the-mill yogurt, um, they're very sweet. It's a very energy-rich food, and it had exactly the same properties as all of the other foods that were making us fat, and yet this one was making us skinny. And so what they, what they concluded was that um, it might have something to do with the probiotic bacteria in the yogurt that was, uh, that was contributing to this. So um, Susan and I ran a, a number of experiments on this, um, got a, gosh, uh, probably about a dozen papers on all the different uh, health effects of uh, one particular uh, organism, Lactobacillus roideri, uh, mostly in mice, so, although we've recently uh, finished a human trial. Um, and, and here's an example, so you can see the difference between these two mice. Um, and, and I say it leads to, you know, these lactobacillus roideri. So uh, these two mice are litter mates. They're, they're brothers, okay, um, really raised uh, almost identically, except the, the one on the left w uh, had this lactobacillus roideri probiotic, not in yogurt, just, uh, just straight up uh, in its drinking water. And you can see that it ended up at a, a much leaner um, body weight um, at full age. Uh, and we also saw a lot of changes with the, uh, the quality of the skin and, and, and the coat. You can see that the coat is nice and shiny, so you say it uh, leads to skinny, shiny mice. Um, <clears throat> another example that uh, a lot of my research has been focused on in particular is the use of fecal transplants. And a lot of us have, have heard of fecal transplants. Um, really, open biome um, is probably, uh, well, is absolutely the, the source of uh, most of the fecal transplants going on. Uh, it's a, uh, the first and, and really only national uh, stool bank. Um, and right now, uh, the, the way that the FDA regulations um, stand, uh, these fecal transplants can only be used uh, in cases of uh, Clostridium difficile infection uh, that are recurrent. And so this means that, that patients have failed antibiotic therapy uh, three or more times. So they failed antibiotics three or more times. Um, often these patients will come to the hospital the first time um, and they don't have a C. diff infection. Uh, they're given antibiotics for a, a different condition. And so we can think of uh, the, the patient showing up at the hospital um, with a different condition, but their, their gut ecosystem is, is fine. It's like the, the forest up there with all the pine trees on, on the left. We give them antibiotics, it's like clear cutting the forest and, and we get rid of um, the natural ecosystem, and, and you know, we're left in this, with this uh, field where uh, you know, we, we might get an overgrowth of, of weeds, if, if you can think of them that way. Um, that really kind of opens things up uh, for those uh, individuals to get a, a C. diff infection if they're exposed to uh, C. diff spores in the environment. Um, and, and now the patient uh, might come back to the clinic uh, and this time they have a gut infection. So of course we give them antibiotics because they have an infection. Um, and that can lead to, to a cycling because now we give them antibiotics, it's like clear cutting that forest again and those patients can continue to, to sort of alternate between having a C. diff infection in their gut and getting antibiotics and you know, getting cured for, uh, uh, for a couple of weeks maybe uh, and then reacquiring another C. difficile infection. So um, for a number of patients, um, this is very problematic and, and they can cycle between antibiotics and, and, and C. diff for, for years. Um, fortunately, there's a, there's a cure, and, and the cure is that after these patients are uh, given antibiotics to cure the C. diff, uh, they're given a fecal transplant. And so that's uh, healthy bacteria from, uh, from a healthy donor, and that, the idea is that it really restores that natural ecosystem. Um, and, and that proves to be uh, quite effective, between 85 and 90 percent uh, uh, effective in, in most of the patients who've already failed antibiotics uh, a, a number of times. So 
Um, that's uh, really just addressing uh, maybe two conditions. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, obesity, or at least gaining weight as, as we get older. We talked about uh, recurrent uh, Clostridium difficile infection. Uh, there's a whole host of other diseases that have been associated with the microbiome, um, although for most of them we don't have this kind of uh, evidence yet that, that we can uh, actually treat them by, by changing the microbiome. Um, but there's a lot of folks working on all of them, and, and almost every week there's, there's a new paper um, finding a new association between some disease and, and microbiome. Um, <clears throat> it may be that uh, some of those diseases can be treated by a fecal transplant or a probiotic of some kind. Um, but even in cases where they can't actually be treated by a microbiome therapeutic, we can think about using the microbiome as a diagnostic of health. Uh, and, and I'll say a few words about a, a study we did with Athos Busvaros a, a few years ago. Athos is a um, doctor over at a Children's Hospital in Boston, and he runs the Pediatric IBD Center. He came to us uh, a few years ago. At that time, uh, there was about a three-year lag between the onset of inflammatory bowel disease in children and the first accurate diagnosis. And what that means is uh, kids can go three years without a suitable treatment um, because they, you know, they might have irritable bowel syndrome, which is a, a, you know, sounds very similar. It's a different disease. It's not an inflammatory condition. Um, and it can, in children especially, it can be hard to differentiate between the two. So uh, what Athos did is he came up with a, a, <clears throat> a cohort uh, for us to uh, a sequence and, and, and look at. And uh, some of the kids, all the kids were referred to his clinic over at Children's Hospital. And some of the kids uh, had symptoms that looked like inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and, uh, but, but did not have IBD. Some of the kids uh, did have IBD and they had one of, of two different forms, either Crohn's disease uh, or ulcerative colitis. And what I'm showing you in this, in this graphic is uh, along the, the different rows here are all the different types of bacteria. And along the columns, you can see there's three groups. There's control. And these are sick kids, but they don't have, they don't have inflammatory disease. Um, CD, that's Crohn's disease, and UC, that's ulcerative colitis. And, and the darker colors here indicate there's more of that bacteria in that particular patient. So every, every column here is a patient. And if we look, none of these bacteria are really a, a, a very good biomarker of disease. There's no bacteria where if a patient had it or if a patient didn't have it, it would uniquely identify them as, uh, you know, one of the two disease states or the, or the healthy state. But what we were able to do is, is take all this information, combine it together with some machine learning, and take all of these very weak predictors and actually make a, a, a pretty strong um, overall predictor of health that, that really took into account information about the, the ecosystem as a whole. Um, <clears throat> what we'd like to do and what, what we're working on now is really giving uh, a lot of this information back to the patient. Um, in collecting, uh, figuring out ways to collect this information more in real time. And so we're launching a project now where we're studying inflammatory bowel disease uh, patients over time, and then we're going to go back after we have uh, about a year of data on these patients where we're tracking them with wearable devices. Uh, we developed uh, kits so they can sample, um, uh, sample their gut bacteria at home um, and really integrate all that information over a year and, and then go back and say, how far in advance of a flare-up of, of disease um, can, can we predict disease by looking at things like microbiome? And so what we'd like to do is uh, give patients a, a mobile app that, that will tell them, hey, you're going to have a flare-up in two weeks, and maybe tell their doctors you're going to have a flare-up, and uh, this patient is going to have a flare-up in two weeks. Uh, maybe there are things that we can do uh, right now to, to, you know, move in and, and start to prevent disease instead of waiting until we have a flare-up and then trying to cure disease. Um, <clears throat> we can sort of do this today. I'll, I'll tell you uh, uh, sort of the last uh, vignette here, um, a story about uh, how my student, Lawrence David, who's now an assistant professor uh, at Duke University, uh, and myself decided to uh, track our microbiomes uh, during uh, 2009. 
So Lawrence um, customized this iPhone app here to collect um, over 300 different um, aspects of our, our daily uh, life. So uh, you know every morsel of food that we ate had to be logged and um, you know our sleep patterns, travel, every, everything you can think of, mood, all of these, um, to really see what correlated with uh, uh, the microbiome. So on the top, you see my microbiome in, in 2009, the different colors there are different uh, types of bacteria, and, and the x-axis is uh, time. Uh, on the bottom is, is Lawrence's microbiome. And what you'll notice is uh, the microbiome is quite stable. So at the beginning and or, or end of a year, um, y you can still uh, very clearly uh, differentiate my microbiome from Lawrence's. But we'll zoom in. Um, this is Lawrence's microbiome, and, and now you can see a little bit more because all the rows here are all the different bacteria. Um, the x-axis, again, is, is time. In red means there's more of that bacteria on that particular day. It's normalized to the median uh, amount of each bacteria. And blue, uh, cooler colors indicate there's less of that bacteria on that particular day. And so what happened to Lawrence during 2009 is uh, in the summer, he decided uh, to go with his wife to, to Bangkok. Uh, she was in med school at the time, and she had an internship over there. And you can see almost as soon as he gets off the plane, um, you see there's a, there's a big row of uh, blue bacteria there, a big uh, sort of line of blue. And, and all those bacteria, uh, his normal, healthy, uh, commensal gut bacteria, uh, kind of disappeared for a few months. Uh, and they were replaced with the, with the big red splotch on top. And, and those are all basically enteric pathogens. So he got this, this traveler's diarrhea that stuck with him the, the whole time. Um, and then almost miraculously, uh, as soon as he got back to the U.S., kind of disappeared. And, and the symptoms went away as well. Uh, this is my microbiome over the same period of time. And, and it's sort of all normal until about three quarters of the way through. Where at the very bottom, uh, you can see that red patch, that's a, a salmonella infection. So I had some undercooked uh, French toast. Uh, I got food poisoning. Um, and then what happened was, was pretty interesting. So on, on the top, you can see that the blue swath there, all those bacteria disappeared. Unlike Lawrence, um, once the salmonella infection had cleared, only, only a few of those bacteria came back. Most of them were, were gone permanently. And they were replaced with the with the that sort of red uh, that red group underneath. What's really interesting here is that the red bacteria that replaced them um, were genetically almost identical to the ones that had left. So so my ecosystem somehow after the salmonella infection knew how to reprogram itself in a very similar way. Okay, um, and maybe the the last thing I'll mention is uh, the Underworlds project, and, and this is moving beyond. Uh, viewing the microbiome of a single individual. This is in collaboration with uh, Carlo Ratti here at uh, MIT, John Runstandler, uh, Martin Poltz, um, uh, Fatih uh, El Tahir, uh, mostly in the civil environmental engineering department and uh, biological engineering. And um, <clears throat> the idea behind this project is uh, to, to look at the, the signature of human activity in, in sewage. And a lot of you know, folks have been studying sewage uh, for many years to see if uh, the things that are going into the wastewater treatment plant are, are being appropriately disinfected and things like that. Um, our goal is a little bit different. We're sampling much farther upstream so that uh, we're no more than 10 or 20 minutes from individuals' homes. Uh, and then we're, uh, we're looking at the microbiome there as um, a way to monitor public health uh, sort of in aggregate. We can look at microbiome. Uh, we can also look at uh, what pharmaceutical products people are using, when they're using them, look for other biomarkers of, of health and disease, um, sort of at the population scale. So uh, I think that's probably a, a good high-level overview, and happy to um, field some, some questions as they come up. Uh, well, your, uh, your experience with food poisonings uh, segues very nicely into the first question we, we received. It's from uh, Ellen in Westwood, Massachusetts. How much do you think about food safety? And uh, will gene sequencing at restaurants or in food production make eating safer? That's a really good question, Ellen. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, at least in the, in the short term, 
um, probably uh, DNA sequencing in uh, in restaurants is, is not going to happen um, anytime soon. Um, at some point in the uh, food production pipeline, um, yeah, I, I, I think it absolutely um, could contribute to, to food safety. Um, Yeah, I, you know, in, in, to, to, to some extent, um, one of the things that we'd like to do in Underworlds um, is, is really, uh, I like to think of it as real-time epidemiology. So as we start to see things like uh, food poisoning and outbreaks and, and things like that, um, that's something that we might be able to, to backtrack and get closer to the source uh, a, a little bit quicker. Um, most of what's going on right now is, uh, is mainly after the fact, um, trying to go through the, the forensics of, of you know, what happened, when, and where. Um, but I can certainly um, see that as, as the technology advances and, and we're able to get the results of DNA sequencing much faster and at the point um, of, of uh, you know, where the sequencing is, is being done, um, yeah, I could see that uh, that definitely playing a role. Neil from Austin, Texas asks, uh, is there, are there any data or theories suggesting that children under five with autoimmune issues like asthma could benefit from any microbiome-based treatments or dietary changes? I know you mentioned uh, irritable or uh, inflammatory bowel mm -hmm. disease. Are there others? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so I, I think one of the things that Neil might be referring to is um, the, this notion, um, this hypothesis that we have called the hygiene hypothesis. And, and the hygiene hypothesis basically states that um, <clears throat> one of the reasons that we're seeing an uptick in, in a lot of autoimmune type diseases, um, especially in uh, developed nations, uh, is that uh, you know we we have vastly improved sanitation and and we're not getting the same interaction um, that we used to uh, with uh, things like parasites and and a lot of bacteria that that might have been more common you know er, earlier in, in human history. Um, that's certainly a good thing. Um, public sanitation is um, is good. It's it's increased lifespans and, and things like this. Um, but but the question is. Is there, is there some way to, to get the, the benefit of being exposed to these organisms and, and properly training the immune system um, at the same time, uh, you know, not really uh, paying the cost of, of, you know, getting infected with parasites or, or something like that? So uh, a lot of people are thinking about this. Um, one, of the, one of the questions is, um, you know, yes, it sounds like a good idea. What exactly would you expose children to? What would be that, that ideal microbiome that you would want kids to see that would somehow prime their immune system and, and, and protect them later in life? Uh, I, I think nobody really knows what that is. Um, and even if you had a hypothesis about what that microbiome is, um, it would be an expensive trial to run uh, because what you'd have to do is you'd have to expose uh, a number of children um, to your, uh, a, a very large number of children um, to, to your product, which, which you know, might seem very, very safe, but we don't know the long-term effects. And then you'd have to wait, and you'd have to wait um, uh, until much later in life to see you know, what fraction of them picked up uh, you know, allergy, asthma, a lot of these autoimmune diseases that have been, that have been associated with it. Um, so, so very difficult, I think, to develop that, uh, that product. Um, but what we do have is the epidemiology, and, and we know things like uh, if, uh, if your mother worked on a farm or something like that, you're much less uh, predisposed to this, this kind of disease. or um, if you had an older brother, <laughs> uh, you're, you're less uh, uh, at, at risk for, for this kind of thing. And, and, and so, um, you know, the, the, the evidence is there. Um, I don't know when we'll see the, the technology development because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's tricky to run these, these clinical trials um, that are preventative because you have to enroll enough people in the trial that a significant fraction are going to uh, end up with disease. 
Alyssa from uh, London uh, in the UK uh, asks about home testing of the microbiome. Uh, what response do you think home testing of the gut will have from the insurance industry? Yeah, um, good question, Alyssa. Um, <clears throat> I don't think uh, uh, I don't think the insurance industry is uh, yet thinking about microbiomes as a as a diagnostic. Um, I know they're they're only very recently sort of warming up to the idea of microbiomes as a therapeutic in the, in the context of uh, fecal microbiota transplantation, um, fecal transplants, uh, and that's because uh, you know they're 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 quite effective and, and quite a bit cheaper than um, some of the you know top line uh, anti C diff uh, drugs, as, you know especially if they they prevent further infections. Um, in terms of uh, home testing and, and diagnostics, I think that's probably going to start out um, with people who are, who are really just interested for their own sake. So, so like myself and my student who, you know, who traced our microbiome, I tell this story, a lot of people say, where, where do I sign up for that? Where do, where do I sign up to, to learn more about it? Um, and now, of course, there, you know, there are places that you can go to uh, sign up. Um, the American Gut Project is, is one. I think it's uh, about $100 or something like that, and, and they'll send you an a easy-to-use kit. You send it back, they'll sequence their microbiome, uh, sequence your microbiome, and, and then send you a, a, a sort of uh, quick analysis of, of what's in there. Um, none of that is really at the stage where it can be used to, to diagnose disease yet. Um, but uh, I think we're going to start to see it as, you know, people who are scientifically curious, probably like a lot of our audience. Here's another question from Austin, Texas. Uh, this uh, is from Justin. Um, and he asks, uh, what is the impact of genetically modified products on the bacteria in our guts? Uh, do GMOs affect the ability of our system to regulate uh, bacteria after infection? Yeah. Uh, so Good question. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, certainly um, dietary changes, uh, you know, over over the past few years, um, have contributed to uh, to changes in our microbiome. Um, we recently conducted a, a study in uh, Fiji looking at Fijian Islanders, and there have been a few other studies uh, more in the developing world. Uh, and, and we do know that uh, between more industrialized nations and, and developing nations, um, there, there are big differences. <coughs> Whether those differences, um, you know, can they be attributed to GMOs or, or more um, a, a difference between raw foods and processed foods, I would say it's probably, it's probably the latter. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of these, these dietary shifts are, are sort of changing the microbiome. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. Um, uh, there tend to be a different set of diseases that, uh, that we face in the in developing uh, world, like, you know, inflammatory uh, bowel disease is, is, is much rarer in the developing world. It's, it's kind of increasing in, in, in industrialized uh, countries. Um, so, so there's probably a lot to learn about these microbiome differences and, and diseases that are uh, specifically of interest um, uh, to, to us here. Okay, uh, Bob in uh, Chatham, Massachusetts asks, have you studied the effect of resistant starch on the digestive system? Yeah, Bob, so, so, so that kind of uh, dovetails really nicely with the, um, with the previous question. Um, one of the things that uh, we eat a lot less of now is uh, these dietary fibers. Uh, and, and that's really uh, what's getting converted by bacteria in, in, in our colons into things like short-chain fatty acids that, that we know are, are really critical for um, uh, proper functioning and, and, and we know um, tend to be uh, offset in, in certain diseases. So. <clears throat> So we've thought a lot about this. Um, we, we're actually running um, a number of experiments where uh, we'll take the contents of uh, uh, the, the human gut, 
uh, and then expose it to, to different dietary fibers to, to see what happens when um, we take bacteria from different people and uh, feed them the same thing. And, and what we see is that um, it doesn't always produce the same byproducts. So uh, there's a number of different short chain fatty acids um, that uh, these fibers can get converted to in the, in the colon. Um, we can get acetate, propionate, butyrate, and, it, and some people may take the same dietary fiber and convert it to butyrate which is thought to be really helpful for diseases like inflammatory bowel disease. Another person might um, convert it all to, to propionate. propionate. Um, and so, so we're starting to see that, um, yeah, m microbiome has, um, has different, uh, different people's microbiome can um, alter the way they deal with those, uh, those dietary fibers. Um, overall, that fiber is one of the big differences between our current diet and, and the diet that we see more in the developing world. Um, and so it, it, it may be that um, uh, getting that fiber and also converting it to the right uh, end products is, uh, is going to be key to, to some of the diseases that, um, that seem to be associated with microbiome. Uh, viewers, we do have time for a few more questions. So. Um uh, remember, if you have questions, uh, enter them in the box below the live stream. Um, this uh, question comes from all the way from Vienna, Austria. Sergio asks, are some of the outputs of your research, like the joint research on obesity, in conflict with what can be called the present best practices in nutrition? Oh, hmm, okay. Uh, good question, Sergio. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't think so. I, I think uh, all all the messages, at least I've, I've shared with uh, with you all today, have have been um, pretty consistent with what your doctor is telling you. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you to to go out and eat uh, ice cream and uh, French fries. Uh, uh, you know, I think uh, dietary fiber is uh, is almost certainly um, really important for the microbiome. Um, and uh, probiotics, um, I'm pretty, uh, uh, pretty positive on, on, on the, the subject of, of probiotics and yogurts and, and things like that. So uh, I think nothing, nothing too controversial. Um, the only thing I'll say is, uh, you know, we, we still don't really know what a healthy microbiome is. And, and if we knew that, then we could probably map out exactly what you would need to eat to, to maintain it, but, but we're really still at those very, very early stages of, of figuring out what that is. Um, and one of the um, dangers is that, uh, you know, we can look at a lot of these, uh, we can look at a lot of healthy individuals and um, kind of see what their microbiome looks like. And it might be that those, those people are healthy because they're eating fiber, and then we see microbes that, that grow up um, on, on dietary fiber, and we say, aha, these are the microbes that are making them healthy. It could just be because they're eating their broccoli. So, so you should just keep, um, keep eating your broccoli, keep eating uh, dietary fiber, um, because we, you know, we, we don't have the connections going from uh, the, the microbes back to, back to human health. Uh, a lot of it could be diet affecting both health and, and, and microorganisms. So uh, yogurt, yes. Uh, yogurt, broccoli, yes. yes. Uh, watch out for the uh, undercooked French toast. <laughs> Have you changed your uh, eating habits in, uh, as a result of your research? I think I, think I changed um, when I had to go through uh, the year-long uh, logging of the diet, right? Because you know you have to... <laughs> I think that's the, the that's the best you know uh, diet plan for anybody you know thinking about uh, uh, eating healthier is uh, you know make a log book and and you know pledge to to share that with all your friends and, and, and colleagues <laughs> and then uh, then you get really self conscious about uh, about what you what what you're going to eat you have to be honest too. Nancy in Andover, Massachusetts. Uh, asks about the water report that she gets from her town, boasting how clean of biomatter the water is. And she asks, is it too clean? <clears throat> Are we doing too much purifying of water? 
either at the source or in our home with those uh, water filters we use. Huh. Um, that's a good question, Nancy. I, I'm not, um, I don't actually know too much about the, those home water filters, the, the, the Brita filters I think she's talking about. Um, um, I, I don't know to what extent they uh, purify the, the drinking water of microorganisms. Um, drinking water in itself is, is not necessarily um, sterile. Um, you know, there, there are microorganisms uh, in, in the tap water, there's microorganisms in, um, in the pipes. Uh, so um, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's too clean. Um, you know, we certainly don't want um, uh, infection, you know, waterborne in, in infection or, or, or anything like that. Uh, there, there are probably better ways to um, get exposure to, to microbes than, than having too many in, um, in our water. Uh, at, at the same time, you know, your drinking water is, uh, is very safe. Um, so uh, I don't know, uh, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot to say about the, about the filters. Uh, here's a question from Donnie in London. Do you envision a future where we can take a fecal pill to cure various GI infections or can we uh, perhaps biobank our own microbiomes. I see a present <laughs> where we can take a fecal pill uh, provided by uh, Open Biome, um, and uh, that uh, pill is is very effective at uh, well, it's more more than one pill, <laughs> um, but it's it's quite effective at curing recurrent uh, Clostridium difficile infections. Um, there have been a few other studies uh, by different groups um, looking at fecal transplants uh, to treat uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it looks like some of those uh, trials have come up positive, and, and so I expect in, in future we'll see pills uh, that you can take that, that have bacteria in them um, that are designed to treat uh, other indications, especially inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and there's also, uh, uh, you know, Eric Pamer has done some work um, on uh, biobanking uh, microbiomes for, for patients undergoing uh, procedures um, where, you know, where, where they're going to get hit with antibiotics. Um, and uh, that's also a service that, that folks can um, get through open biome as well. So, so that future is already here, Donnie. Um, and uh, I, I see it only expanding into uh, new disease areas as, as we get the evidence that it's, that it's safe and effective. Uh, well, we have time for just one more question, and it comes from Hugh in Connecticut. He asks, uh, is there reasonable funding of microbiome-related clinical trials to uh, provide answers to, to uh, some of these questions? Yeah, Hugh, so um, funding is always limited. Uh, it, it's certainly an exciting area, and, and I think that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the funding is out there. It really depends on the disease that, uh, that you're interested in. And so um, for, for a number of, of different diseases, um, there's funding to, to, to run big trials. Uh, but the, the part of the excitement about microbiome is that um, we don't actually, so, so it looks like all the diseases that people look at, there's an association with microbiome. What fraction of those diseases um, are going to be treatable, let's say with a pill or with a fecal transplant or something like that, we really don't know. And, and the best way to find out is, uh, is just to, to, to run a small trial, you know, when there's, there's a little evidence saying that it, that it uh, may be efficacious. Um, so if, if your disease of interest is sort of at the top of everyone's list and, and, it, and it affects, uh, you know, a, a fairly large market, so the pharmaceutical com uh, companies are interested in it, um, then there's probably a lot of funding. Um, some of the most exciting diseases, I think, um, uh, are, you know, affect a, a smaller number of people uh, and there's not good drugs on the market because it is a small market, um, but there's evidence that uh, fecal transplant may be, uh, may be effective. Uh, and so for, for uh, some of these diseases, 
um, you know, it's 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 more difficult to uh, to find funding for for those trials. So so it's sort of a hedge answer. Y yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, I'm, there's going to be a lot of money going into diabetes and microbiome, um, less so for uh, for for smaller diseases. Well, this topic is just endlessly fascinating. Um, on behalf of the MIT Alumni Association, I'd like to thank you, Professor Eric Alm, for joining us here. And thanks to the MIT alumni uh, for tuning in and asking so many good questions. If we didn't get to yours, we will pass it along to Professor Alm after the webcast. And you can share other questions or comments on Twitter using the hashtag MIT Better World. You can also view an archive of past faculty forums online by visiting the Learn section on the Alumni Association website. Please join us next month for another se session of Faculty Forum Online. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.